So do my environmentalist friends. Has anyone ever looked at you and be like, Hey, shut up, go out the tree. Or, hey, 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 stop talking about this animal rights, environmentalist shit. Go say the word somewhere else. Or, oh, ta, 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 ta. why you gotta be so difficult? Also, how come it sound like a fake Italian mafia? This video is for you. Environmentalism at this point in time seems like a pretty dirty word and environmentalists in general don't have the best rep. In this video, I break down some of my favorite environmentalists. I argue that they're not tree huggers, although some are vegan. Some of them will tell you why they're vegan. We'll ask you aggressively why you're not vegan. We'll proudly show off the new metal straw that they just bought. Enjoy. So on that note, let's dive further into this list. On the top of the list is a rather obscure name, it's John Moyer. He's the person who first got Yosemite National Park established, and he's widely credited with bringing conservation to the forefront of American politics. So here's what we know about him. He took courses in geology and botany at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I mean, botany kind of is about trees, but it's more about the science and not about the hugging. And then when he left university, he worked at a wagon wheel factory. Under an accident almost left him blind, when he eventually regained his sight, he saw the world and his purpose in a new light. Muir lived in Yosemite for a long time. All in all in his life, he published six volumes of writing, all of them dedicated to observations in wildlife. He was more of a writer and less of a tree hugger. In fact, writing kind of uses paper, doesn't it? All right, next on the list, Sir David Attenborough. I love this guy. So everyone knows him as the guy on TV who has a great soothing voice, is really engaging, pretty much the opposite of me, but most people don't know that at the start of his career, he was actually discouraged from appearing on screen because one of his producers thought that his teeth were too big. Anyway, when he was younger, he studied in Cambridge and he got a degree in zoology and geology. And in his early career, he basically started out producing television shows and documentaries, most of them where he didn't want to appear on screen, and eventually, one of his co-producers fell ill and he ended up having to be on screen, and we all know where it goes from there. So the third person on my list is someone who had a profound impact on me, and I think is one of the key reasons that I ended up going down the environmentally conscious path that I did. And he is none other than Al Gore. Boy, does he have an interesting personal history. So Al Gore grew up in his family farm in Carthage, Tennessee, where his family grew hay and tobacco. So when he first enrolled in university in Harvard, he wanted to study English, but soon after he switched to study government. Like, what does that even mean, though? But anyway, he spent most of his time in his sophomore year watching TV, smoking pot, and playing pool. Pretty much the usual college stuff. And then in his junior year, he took an oceanography class that sparked his interest in climate change as well as other environmental issues. But the environmental aspect wouldn't even appear until much, much later in his career. His undergrad thesis was titled The Impact of TV on the Conduct of Presidency. Very, very academic. Then after that, he shipped off to Vietnam for the Vietnam War. Didn't really do much because he was a journalist, came back and decided to run for politics. His real impact came when he was vice president for Bill Clinton between 1993 and 2001, where he launched many environmental initiatives and supported some others, including the Kyoto Protocol, which at that point was very well intentioned. And well, nobody really knew that it was going to go off the rails like it did, but it did and it created the mess that we're in now. He started the 2006 American documentary in Inconvenient Truth, and at least in my mind, he was one of the people who was critical to bringing the issue of climate change to the forefront of many discussions. Fun fact, he became a vegan in 2013. Go plants! But that's enough of talking about old white men. I mean, we really hear too much about them in class anyway. So moving on to some women who have an impact in the environmental sphere. Jane Goodall, who's pretty much a household name in every household, I would hope, and worked with primates, namely chimps, in the Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania. She actually started out working as a secretary for an archaeologist and a paleontologist who was based in Kenya. And then after some finagling, she ends up in Cambridge in 1962 to do a PhD in ethology. Not to be confused with ecology, ethnology, ethnography, you get the idea. Also, you have no idea how many takes it took to get that right, jeez. Fun fact, she was the 8th person in Cambridge at that time to do a PhD without having done any other sort of degree before that. And now she's well known as a protector of chimps, of wildlife, and an advocate against habitat loss across the world, mainly because it threatens primates, but also because of other threats as well. Alright, moving quickly on to Erin Brockovich, who has a film named after her. I have actually never seen the film. But if you have, great for you. She's an American legal clerk, but she's not actually formally trained in law, and she's also an environmental activist. And in 1993, she makes a name for herself by assembling a legal case against Pacific Gas and Electric Company after finding evidence that the company has been polluting local ponds and groundwater due to its chemical discharge. She wins the case, makes a boatload of money, and goes on to fight other environmental causes relating to pollution in her part of the world. And lastly, there's the mother of modern environmentalism, Rachel Carson. She originally studies at the Pennsylvania College for Women, and she originally declares her major to be English. However, she soon sees the light and switches her major to marine biology 1928. Now for those of you who don't know me, I happen to have a soft spot for marine biology. Nothing against English, but marine biology is better. 
Anyway, she's an avid writer and she contributes to newspapers while she's in school and then when she graduates, she starts contributing to journals and writing articles. She even writes radio broadcasts for the US Bureau of Fishery to kind of advocate fishery stuff. Anyway, she moves to Silver Spring and in 1957, she switches her focus to overuse of pesticides. And she writes one of the most compelling environmental books of all time, Silent Spring. Although, I also have not read the book, so I'm just guessing it's compelling. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it is and I'm gonna read it soon. But okay, that's it, we're done with white people. Well, let's talk about people from other places. So another leading environmental activist who I've heard much about is Vandana Shiva, who works to promote biodiversity and sustainability in agriculture and works to support small farmers and agriculture in India. Out of everyone on this list, she has my favorite background. So she studied physics at Punjab University and did a master's in the philosophy of science at the University of Guelph, Ontario. What was a master's thesis, you might ask? Well, I can tell you that it was closely related to biodiversity conservation and protection of wildlife and sustainable farming. It was titled, Changes in the Concept and Periodicity of Light. And for a PhD, she gets even more tree huggerish and just more namby-pamby. Her PhD is titled, Hidden Variables and Locality in Quantum Theory which is absolutely what you would expect from somebody who protects farmers and agriculture in India. For example, she fights against large corporations that have created patents for different strains of neem and basmati rice. And lastly, switching continents, Dr. Wangari Mathai is an internationally renowned Kenyan environmental activist and Nobel laureate. She founded and ran the Greenbelt Movement, which is an NGO based in Kenya, that focuses on the planting of trees, environmental conservation, and women's rights. Personally, she also dabbled a bit in politics because her environmental activism courted a lot of political resistance. Her works led her to become the first African woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. In my opinion, she's really badass. She attempted to halt government construction of a large building in Uhuru Park, and she wrote numerous complaints, leveraged political allies, and also participated in the hunger strike. She was once besieged by government forces and hid in her home successfully for three days until police had to cut through the bars that she had installed in her windows to arrest her. She went on to be an outspoken environmental activist in Kenya. And what's her background look like? She majored in biology and minored in chemistry and German in Kansas and did a master's in biology from the University of Pittsburgh. So out of all the people that I've listed so far, I don't think anyone would really fall in the category of Namby Pamby tree hugging animal loving I'm gonna save the world bullshit environmentalist. <laughs> don't ask me where the accent came from, I don't know. But to be fair to tree huggers, there is one notable person who did come up in some of my searches. Julia Hill, on a road trip to California, discovers that the Pacific Tree Loggers Company is about to clear a whole bunch of giant redwoods in Humboldt County. So she does pretty much what any single one of us would think of doing. She hauls herself up into one of the giant redwoods, names it Luna, and stays there for 738 days as an act of civil disobedience. And also so that they can't cut the tree down, because then she'd come down with the tree and it wouldn't be pretty. She learns numerous survival skills while on the tree, such as not washing her feet, so that the sap from the tree makes her feet sticky, makes it easier to climb around the branches. And she also has to endure freezing rain, 60 km per hour winds, intimidation by the loggers, helicopter harassment, you know, run the mill corporate bullying tactics. So yeah, shout out to one of the greatest tree huggers out there. But I think the observation is clear. Most environmentalists aren't what people actually think environmentalists are. They're well-educated, well-connected, very, very passionate about their cause, and come from a different range of disciplines, usually those relating to communication or outreach. Surprise, surprise, tell a good story, save an ecosystem. Don't quote me on that. And I think if you're still watching this video, which, why? Why? I just want to say that most environmentalists are actually focused more on ecosystems than individual organisms. We recognize that our study organisms play an important part in the entire ecosystem and if you pull out a certain organism, for example bees, the entire house of cards of the ecosystem comes tumbling down. And guess who happens to live at the top of every single ecosystem across the world? Why don't you tell me Max, who is it? A final thing I want to emphasize is that not all environmentalists work alone. If you think about all the diplomats and politicians who were involved in the Paris Climate Agreement, all those who were involved in the Montreal Protocol which banned chemicals that reduced the thickness of the ozone layer, or going even further back to those who were involved in the Kyoto Protocol as well, all of them could be considered to some extent to be environmentalists. And at the end of the day, I personally am motivated by ensuring the continuation of the human enterprise. So if you're an environmentalist and if somebody shouts at you, hey, tree hugger, you just go over there and just give him a nice big hug. Because I think that's what we really stand for. All right, that's all for this video. It's been a bit long, but I hope you've enjoyed it. As usual, like this video if you like it, subscribe if you want to see more, share it with your friends and throw any aggressive comments in the bottom and I'll pretend like I never saw them. Well, that's all for this one. I'll catch you in the next one.